Hey yo guys, Tori Terrible here, my name is Michael and I'm back with some more Shadowverse. So today I will be going over all of the Tempest of the Gods legendary cards, um, except for the Shadowcraft ones which I went over in my previous video. But yeah, I think they're really cool cards and without further ado, let's just get right into it. So let's start off with the Forestcraft legendaries. Elf Queen is a 7 play point 6-6. Six, six that heals you for the up to the amount of shadows you have and then sets the amount of shadows to zero so first things first uh this will not see play in the famous path to purgatory forest craft decks because all those those decks are pretty good and they do accumulate a lot of shadows they would really not spend those shadows uh before path to purgatory comes out because that really just screws with their whole game plan so the question is what kind of deck does this fit in um it seems that in this expansion psy games has really been pushing towards a control forest craft archetype, a uh, deck that goes late game instead of trying to end early game like a tempo forest or even the a roach forest that was so famous um, before they nerfed the goblin mage. So Elf Queen would fit pretty well in a control forest de craft deck. Um, she's the only source of uh, you know class specific healing that forest craft has outside of fairy beast, but unlike fairy beast, she's not understated and she's a bit less situational. Um, as long as you have those shadows, and you will be accumulating a lot of shadows throughout the game due to all those fairies dying and all those tokens that you have. Um, so she will be able to heal for you, whereas Fairy Beast does rely on having a big hand, which may not always be possible, although Forcecraft usually does have a pretty big hand. Um, so yeah, she's kind of a direct upgrade to from Fairy Beast, except that she is a bit more expensive, and when it comes to kind of stabilizing versus aggressive decks, the earlier the better. However, Forcecraft does have a lot of good anti-aggro, you know, in and of itself. They have uh, Elf Child May, they have Sylvan Justice, um, they have Ancient Elf. So making it to turn 7 with a good amount of health, and then playing this card to really, you know, screw over those aggro decks isn't a bad idea. Um, I think this card will probably be run as like a one of in control forestcraft decks if they do become a thing because despite roach being nerfed and despite ptb being not so good right now um they're still very powerful decks and they do give control forest a run for its money um wolf bolt forest uh, white wolf and silver bolt combo is currently like the control forest that we see mostly but it's not so good still with all these new tools uh, control force may be a thing and if control force is a thing I think Elf Queen will be a pretty good thing. So after the beautiful Elf Queen, we get this monstrosity, Deepwood Anomaly. It's an 8 play point 8-8, eight, eight, which is pretty good stats, but on 8 play points, you want to have other effects. For example, Odin banishes an enemy thing, uh, Mordecai keeps coming back to life, and Lucifer not only heals you, but also provides a huge threat on the board after you play it, because if you evolve it and hit face, that's 13 damage. So let's see what Deepwood Anomaly's effect is. Uh, it says whenever this follower attacks the enemy leader, deal damage to that leader until their defense drops to zero. Uh, I think this will be like Astaroth's Reckoning, um, in that after doing the original 8 damage from Anomaly, or you know more of its evolved, um, you will then take a certain amount of damage that would have killed you before modifiers. Currently, the only real modifier I can think of is Dragon Claw Pendant, and that doesn't really apply to Deepwood Anomaly, but the next expansion does come with a bunch of other damage modifiers, which may very well affect this effect, and may not make it a uh, one-hit KO 100% of the time. But anyways, beyond all that, let's think about this card. It seems scary. Uh, like Seraph, it's an auto-win. Um, but unlike Seraph, it's a lot easier to remove. And although people have been like doom saying it, have been saying like this is going to speed up the meta, this is going to, you know, kill control because it's an eight point win condition. I don't think it is, because control has a lot of ways to remove this card. Um on turn eight, it is susceptible to Odin as well as all the other five play point um removals, you know, execution, dance of death, call of coccytus. Hell, it's even susceptible to the boosted call of coccytus. So you can call of coccytus it and grab the five play point thirteen thirteen servant of darkness. Um he can be traded into. He is a pretty big card to trade into. An evolved Mordecai doesn't just do it. Um but it's not too difficult to have some sort of board to contest him, even in the late game, supposedly anyways. Um he gets killed by Tsubaki. So in general he's pretty easy to remove. Admittedly, if you don't remove him, you theoretically lose, right? 
But then again, when you really think about it, uh, like Lucifer and even like Mordecai, if you don't manage to remove them for one turn, you kind of basically lose as well because they start just hitting your face really hard anyways. Um, this takes that, you know, drag on, maybe small slim chance of winning, and kind of, you know, gets rid of it because it immediately kills you. But keep in mind that it's also like an 8 play points card that's like, it's kind of slow. And it's, it's, it's really not as scary as people think it is, I think. Um, I can see this ru being run as maybe a 1 or 2 of in a control force deck that I mentioned previously. Because the idea of many control decks it is to grind out their opponents. Um, some control decks do have like a combo finisher. Like for example, Control Blood can use Bloody Mary, Dire Bond, Razor Claw. Um, control Sword uses you know just their Alberts to finish off. But a lot of control decks work on like a grinder path. So they'll like wear down their opponent's resources, and when their opponent's resources are gone, they'll drop the big card. And Deep Wood Anomaly is one of those big cards. Like if you've force your opponent to use all their evolutions, to use all their removals, and then you drop this card, well then you win. Um, so it's kind of like a more firm win condition for a grinder control forest, but beyond that, it's actually not as scary as people think it is, despite being an auto win, because it may not be an auto win 100% of the time due to some of the new damage modifying cards, and despite being an auto win, I mean, Lucifer is also technically an auto win if it like survives one turn anyway. So, yeah, it's pretty good. So let's move on to the Swordcraft Legendaries. Uh, this one, the Wayne of the Round Table, got a lot of hype. He's a 4 play point three four, which is about average in stats, the same as, you know, the new Nymph. It's the same as Amelia. It's just pretty good stats. However, his effect is pretty insane, I think. Um, whenever this follower attacks, subtract one from the cost of all commanders in your hand. So, uh, this allows you to play those commanders one turn early. It won't affect Albert's uh, enhance effect, so Albert will still have to be played on turn 9 to get the immunity and double attack, but it will you allow you to play a 4 play point Albert alongside something else, say. So, that's pretty good. Um, admittedly, Swordcraft doesn't have much card draw, but they do have a lot of- they do have Tutor in Made Leader, so I would expect this card to be hitting 2, maybe- three commanders at most in your hand, which is still quite a bit of value. Um, this will mainly find its way into control sword decks. It is very slow for aggressive sword decks, um, especially because to play on turn four, you'd have to use and an evolve with it, and uh, aggressive sword decks would much prefer to use your evolve somewhere else. Um, he also has an enhance effect. If you enhance him, he gets played at six play points, but he gets plus one, plus one rush, so it makes him a four, five, who will basically guaranteed get that uh, discount in hand, and that's pretty good, I think. Um, he is a crazy card. I can't really think of any solid immediate combos, but like allowing you to get like that front guard general out of turn earlier, allowing you to play, you know, just that <laughs> not even flame blade slayer, but like other big cards a turn earlier, allowing you to play more on curve with some cheap commanders, cheaper commanders rather, uh, make this card kind of scary. However, I don't think he's the OP OP scary like you know, swordcraft destroys all card that everyone's been saying he is. Um he is really good and I think you'd want to run maybe two, maybe even three of him in swordcraft decks, although swordcraft does have a lot of good four play point options already. But he's competing with a lot of other pretty good cards like Gino uh, like Goblin Breaker Tina, which is a pretty good uh, swing versus aggressive decks. So, although he will find his way in control decks, I think, um, he may not be a 3 of because the commanders you want to uh, discount may not be that worth discounting, and you may not get as many of them in your hand at once. So, yeah, good card, maybe not that crazy. So, after the manly, manly Gawain, we have Roland the Incorruptible. I thought Roland was... <laughs> never mind. So she's a 7 play point four five. Uh, that's really understated. The one other 7 play point four five I can think of is Underworld Watchman Kali, and that card's basically been carrying Shadow on his back since he came out. He's really good. So Roland should be really good. Uh, Roland has wards, so does Kali. Uh, Roland has a fan fairy. Summon a Durandel the Incorruptible if there isn't an ally Durandel the Incorruptible in play. 
So really, we're thinking it's the Dillion Bell that does it, right? Let's see what Dillion Bell does. Uh, it says, enemy followers, spells, and amulets can't deal more than 4 damage at a time. So let's think about what this means. This means that if your Fangblade Slayer trades into something and still has 5 health left, your opponent has to go 2 for 1. This means that your Front Guard General will probably at least take 2 hits before going down and taking a 3rd one with the Fortress Guard you summon. Um, this is pretty good. You can play this after a Bahamut, for example, and make that Bahamut's attack basically 4. Admittedly, you probably don't want to let that Bahamut live still in case they, you know, banish your Dillion Bell and start wailing on your face, but it's a thought. Um, as an amulet, this card is pretty hard to remove. Uh, it may not be high priority enough for an Odin, although because Swordcraft has, like, only a few other cards you really want to Odin, like you may want to Odin an Albert or a Front Guard, um, this card may still warrant an Odin. Um, this card is still destroyed by Bahamut, so if you play it before Bahamut, if you play, you know, uh, Roland before Bahamut, um, it's still going to get destroyed and you're still going to have that Bahamut. Um, keep in mind that it says summon one if there isn't one in play. So if you run more than one of this card and you play her and the Durin Bell comes out, but you have another one in your hand, the second one becomes a 7 play point four five ward with no other effect. That's pretty bad. So I think Roland will really only be run at, as an at most one of in control sword decks, obviously, because she's both late and understated. Um, she's not really that good of stabilized against aggressive decks because they do a lot of small pings rather than like big immediate ones. So for example, um, like it would reduce the nine play points Albert Evolve to like eight damage instead of 10, but that's still like a lot of damage. So, yeah, um, she's more for, like, establishing and, like, keeping a board, um, in that she herself takes at least two hits to kill, and then she makes a lot of the other things a lot harder to remove that late in the game. Um, she will prevent, I think, uh, uh Deepwood Anomaly from killing you in one shot. Um, Deepwood Anomaly will do four damage with, you know, his original attack, and then his effect will do another four damage because it can't do any more because it's been set down to four by Durandal. Um, so she does prevent a lot of, like, KOs in the, in that respect. And, like, a lot of combos, but she's not really worth running more than one of, because drawing two of her and then, like, not getting a second Durandale is pretty bad. And, to be honest, I'm not sure she'll always be run, because she's a very defensive card, but she doesn't defend well against aggressive decks. And... Swordcraft has, like, a lot of other really good cards already. They have Front Guard General, who is arguably a more just straight-up, like, screw you to aggro than Roland is. Um, Roland fits more in a deck that wants to establish a late-game board presence, which may be hard because cards like Bahamut exist. So yeah, um, I really like her design. I really like Durandal as a card because it does prevent a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, one-shots, one-hit KOs that may be coming with this new expansion. But... I'm not sure that this card will always be in Swordcraft decks. Um, and if it is, I'm pretty sure it's only going to be run as a one of. So, Runecraft cards. Uh, as if Daria wasn't crazy enough last expansion, we have World Wielder Ginger. Um, this card has a really long text that I'm not going to read straight up, but basically... It makes all of the cards in your all the followers in your hand rather cost zero, but then doesn't allow any of their effects to activate. So and this it gives you this effect for one turn. Um she is a nine play point four four, so she is again horrifically understated, but you can get theoretically so much value out of her. Um imagine like world wielder <laughs> world wielder into like Lucifer and Gilgamesh. And crazy things like that. Admittedly, nothing can attack space. Um, so, it's basically just using her to... She's just used to establish a big, fat, scary board presence. And this seems insane. At least at first. But, when we really think about it, having her get a lot of value also requires Runecraft to run a lot of value. You need to run Lucifer in your gift. You need to uh, run... You know, Gilgamesh, or not really Gilgamesh, because that's not, like, a very good card. But, you know, run whatever other cards you really want to pull with her. 
which means it's cute, but when you think about it, no RuneCraft decks really run those big cards. I, I admit that my uh, control RuneCraft deck does, but even my control RuneCraft pre uh, prefers to actually get the fan base of the followers. Like, if, if I play, like, a, a Satan, I want the Apocalypse deck. I don't want it to just be a 6-6. Six -six. Um, but, you know, Ginger would actually prevent it from becoming, uh, from getting the Apocalypse deck. If I play Mithril Golem, I want to get the opponent void clear, not just get a 6-7. So, this deck, this card does seem pretty crazy, but it seems more like a mean crazy than an actually good crazy, because she just doesn't fit in with any of the Runecraft archetypes, like Daria, you just play Daria and you, you spam the thing with zero cost spell boosted followers anyways, why do you need this card, which comes so very, very late, may I add, and doesn't really give you much else, um, because Daria also refreshes your hand, right? So... In the end, although Ginger looks really cool and sounds really cool, I don't think she's actually going to see much play at all. Maybe in the occasional funny control rune meme deck, but even control rune doesn't really want her. So I'm glad to see that Earthrite's getting some love in this expansion. Um, I really like Earthrite as a deck archetype. I think it's a very well-rounded archetype. Um, it can deal well with a lot of decks in the meta, although it doesn't excel at anything in particular, just because it has the tools to do so. This card, Hulking Giant, is another addition to that toolbox. So here's a fanfare, discard all Earth tickets from your hand and gain plus two plus two for each discarded card, and then you cannot be targeted by enemy spells and effects. So I think that's awesome. I think that's great, because you can't just remove this with like a dance of death. You can't just remove it with, um, you know, like Crimson Sorceries and stuff like that. You have to like trade into it, you have to use like Famous Decree, you have to use Raging Corpse, you have to somehow pick this guy off and he's gonna have like a really big body, um, or at least theoretically, anyways. But even six play point six six is not undervalued. That's like pretty solid. So let's take a step back and kind of like evaluate this card compared to Ancient Alchemist. He's one turn later. Um, he's the same turn as Professor of Taboos and Calamitous Curse. He's one turn before Juno's Laboratory. Those are the other big Earthrite cards that, like, a control Earthrite deck, because I think this will fit more into a control deck, um, will run. But with Hulking Giant, you're tossing those signals out of your hand. You're saying, I'm not playing these anymore. I'm not going to get the value I could have gotten out of them anymore. I'm putting it all on this Hulking Giant card. Which is fine, because he is, you know, untargetable, and he is really big. But, like, keep in mind that if you do play him and you do throw your synergies away, you will be, like, out of fuel, kind of, if they manage to get rid of him. Because although, like, Juno's Laboratory still gets good effects um, without Earthrite, and although Calamus Curse can still wipe a board without having an Earthrite on the board, um, you're losing any extra benefits you may have gotten. And keep in mind that Earthrites are usually valued at a... Uh, as a 3-3 with Ward, the Guardian Golems. So gaining plus 2, plus 2 is not as good, although, admittedly, for this card, you don't actually have to play the Earthrite to get those stats. So, yeah, I think this card is pretty good. I think this card is pretty crazy. It may be like a 1 or even 2 of an Earthrite deck. I don't think a 3 of, because having 3, even though it's like a well-statted follower with like the potential to become insane, um, you really don't want to lose that many Earthrites, especially because... Uh, Earthrite Rune has, like, good tutor in both Alchemist, but not actually that good draw. They really only have, like, Teachings of Creation, since most of them don't run uh, Fate's Hand or Insights. So, yeah, I like this card a lot. I will definitely be trying it out myself. And I, I think it could actually push Earthrite into a higher tier of playing. Yeah. So, uh, Dragoncraft Legendary. Um, by the way, I'm sorry for the change in formatting. I got this card, uh, I got this info from a different site than I got the rest of them. Um, I think this came from Pocket Gamer. But anyways, Ouroboros. So, Dragoncraft has been known to have bad legendaries. Uh, Fafnir kind of got outclassed by Bahamut. Uh, Zunitra's never played. Um, Imperial Dragoon is a legendary for a deck archetype that's really crappy right now. So, when people first saw Ouroboros, they were like, 8 play points, 8, 4, more like 8 play point thing that dies to carrot. Well, you know, an evolved ultimate carrot can kill it, right? So, let's look at the effects, though, that it gives, because, um, again, as I said before, with, uh, with Deepwood Anomaly, 
when you play something on 8, you want it to have extra effects. And Ororo's does have extra effects. Um, when you play him, you deal 3 damage to an enemy. That's basically Demonic Strike. You can use it to deal phase, or more likely, you'll be using it for board control. Um, and then, last words, he restores 3 defense to the leader, and then pops it back into your hand so you can play him again. So, I know I said he's like 8, so theoretically he could give me Odin, which would negate his last words. But, let's face it, you're playing this in ramp Dragon Craft, and you're hitting like 8 play points. Turn 6 or so, I think. So, turn 6, you play this. They remove him. You play it again. They remove him. You keep playing it. And you can evolve it. Maybe you don't evolve it. But they'll probably be evolving to deal with it. And Oroboros himself, the uh, fa fanfare, will hopefully poke at an enemy. Maybe even hit the enemy's face to put some added pressure on. Who knows? But basically, although people have been calling this card bad because of the awkward stat line, it's actually not that bad of a card. Um, coming with that, you know, Demonic Strike attached to him, he can really kind of turn the tide of battle. And then the healing is nice as well because it means your opponent can't pressure you that hard. And they really will want to deal with this card because 8 attack evolves, you know, 10 attack. It's not something you want to ignore, especially in a class that has like 4 tape for up to 7 burst damage or Genesis Dragon for up to 9. So... Basically, he is, like, the ultimate, ultimate carrot, but unlike other, unlike ultimate carrots, he's arguably better. He's bigger. He's scarier. He puts more pressure. He grinds harder than ultimate carrots does, and that's pretty scary. So I think this card is actually pretty good. I'm not sure if it's enough to drag Dragoncraft up from the depths of Oblivion, but he's not a bad card, as many people say it is. I think he definitely deserves at least a trial run in Ramp Dragon, and Ramp Dragon's not like a horrible archetype right now, it's it's okay um, in, in most matchups, it's pretty good versus control, and so this may even help Ramp Dragon get even better, and push it into, you know, where people know it. So yeah, don't just leave Ororos by the wayside, give him a try. So after the somewhat controversial Ororos, we go into Sybil of the Water Room. Uh, Sybil of the Water Moon has Fanfare, gain an empty playpoint orb if this card is played on your 5th turn or later. Um, so, it says 5th turn, not uh, 5 playpoints, which means you'll really only be appreciating this card if you haven't had any ramp until turn 5. You play her, uh, she'll give you that extra playpoint and push you into overflow next turn, which isn't bad, admittedly. Um, Dragoncraft always likes having more ramp. Um, they run 3 of every ramp card already, at least ramp Dragoncraft does. And so they'll probably run three Sybils as well. Um, also, this doesn't mean that she'll be useless after turn 5, besides her other effect, of course. But it doesn't mean that the extra playpoint will be useless after turn 5, just that it will be kind of less appreciated because you'll already be hitting that those high playpoint numbers that you want anyways. But it's her other effect that makes her pretty good. Um, at the end of your turn, restore 3 defense to your leader if overflow is active for you. So, basically, this makes her a mini Lucifer. Um, she does come a bit earlier than Lucifer. She comes on turn 7. Um, theoretically, you can play it even earlier than that, and then the effect will come, will, will hit on turn 7, which is a thing, I guess? I, I don't know if that's really earlier than Lucifer. But anyways, um, Ramp Dragon has had pretty bad runs versus aggressive decks because they ramp, but aggression just hits face. They ramp, but, you know, you get your face hit a lot harder, and you end up losing because you can't, you know, really do anything about being hit to the face. Um, Sybil kind of helps prevent that. Um, that 3 defense at the end of the turn is really good. It turns into a pseudo ward for aggro, and she has, like, a pretty solid 5, uh, play point full 5 body that they have to trade into, um... And again, the healing is just really nice to stabilize. She doesn't have the gargantuan power that a lot of ramp dragons like to run at their top end, but she's like a good, you know, stopgap between the early game ramp and the late game powerhouses. She she's kind of there to smooth the curve a little bit. And both of her effects kind of imply that because she not only helps you ramp a teeny bit faster, um, if you play her past turn five, which you may be desperate for extra ramp, who knows? She also has that heal, which kind of helps you stabilize versus aggressive decks. Um, even not so aggressive decks will help you kind of like stay healthy. So yeah, I think this is a pretty good card that will be run as a three of in basically every single uh, ramp Dragoncraft deck. It will make it will force them to be less greedy because they will not be able to run as much top end if they play her. But she's definitely worth playing over some top end cards just because she's so good at stabilizing 
and her both of her attacks are very useful. So Blitzkrieg is also known for having some meme legendaries. Um, they have Soul Dealer, they have uh, Beast Dominator. Admittedly, they do have Queen Vampire and Bloody Mary as well, so there's that. But anyways, let's look at Belphegor. Uh, Belphegor is a 4 play point 4-4 four, four that is slightly overstated. 4 um, play points usually nets you a 3-4 or occasionally a 4-3. So let's look at her stats. Dancer, draw 2 cards. Deal damage to your leader until their defense... Defense drops to 10 if Vengeance is not active for you, for your leader. So, another Vengeance focus card, early game Vengeance focus card, kind of like Soul Dealer, less sta less well statted than Soul Dealer. Soul Dealer is a 6-4, but it has Ward as well. Um, but Belphegor also sets you, will set you down to Vengeance, so it won't heal you to Vengeance, it will set you down to Vengeance. And although the card makes it seem like the damage will be, will, uh, Keep on getting dealt if you don't hit Vengeance, which means theoretically if you combo this with Bloody Mary, you get an infinite damage loop. Um, I think it will probably just do damage once, again, much like Asteros Reckoning, and much like I think Deepwood Anomaly will work. But so let's look at this card as a card, I guess. Um, it's overstated, but it probably won't see much use in aggro. Uh, Blood aggro already has like a bunch of really good plays as it is, like really good cards as it is. It doesn't really need this weird card that, you know, crops the matchup versus other aggro decks, even if it does activate Vengeance in case you wanted to combo it with like Dark General or something. I don't know. Um, so this will see its way potentially into control blood, but not really. Drawing two cards is nice, don't get me wrong. Even at the cost of health, drawing two cards is nice. But on turn 3, Control Blood often plays Dire Bond, which already starts drawing like 2 cards per turn. Um, sometimes Dire Bond even overdraws you, and it draws a combined total of 3 cards overall without losing you permanently health, you know, because Dire Bond restores it over time. So, Belvagor's setting you to Vengeance is good theoretically for activating Vengeance cards like, you know, Revelation, like Righteous Devil, like. Dark General, even if you want to run that, but Vengeance is a pretty dangerous place to be in, um, even early game, because although like things like the Albert combo cannot come out, like the Albert Evolve ten damage to face cannot come out early game, um, being set that low early game, even if you're using it for an overstated minion, um, it's just not a good idea. I think I. You can of course use your Vengeance cards to recover from that like giant loss in health, and you will probably draw some of the good ones with the draw two cards, but basically I don't think Belphegor does anything super special that warrants using her uh, in current iterations of Control Blood. Control Blood already has enough safer draw in Dire Bond, and Dire Bond does kind of push you towards Vengeance if you need it. Um, Control Blood doesn't want to, doesn't need to always be in Vengeance, doesn't even need to be in Vengeance this early, although it does get good value out of, like, Righteous Devil if it is. Um, so, yeah. On the other hand, I do see that, uh, Psy Games is pushing for a mid-range Blood. This expansion with cards like this, with cards like Blood Moon, which I may review later, um, and, uh, the, the Airship card... So this card could theoretically see its way into a mid-blood deck that plays like Dark Generals and that plays aggressively and starts to hit face with Vengeance boosted cards before it's too late. But I don't really see a mid-range deck coming together like that, and I still don't think Belvagor is worth running over the more safer, more reliable Dire Bond or something like that, because it's a dead draw versus aggressive matchups, and her stats and her cards are just really not worth the potential punishment you get for for setting yourself so low so early. So uh, yeah, I got this uh, different formatting off the same site. Uh, I got the uh, Ouroboros. But anyways, Maelstrom Serpent. They're, they're both snakes, you know. It makes sense ish, right? Anyways, Maelstrom Serpent, eight play point five five. That's Mordecai. Except Mordecai is really good because Mordecai keeps staying on the board unless he gets Odin, in which case you cry because your Mordecai just got Odin. What makes Maelstrom Serpent good? Well, Maelstrom Serpent takes all of Mordecai's theoretical value and spits it out in one place. Um, you play this card on 8, it's technically an 8 play points 10-10 because it summons another Maelstrom Serpent immediately. What's another 8 play point 10-10 we think of? 
Well, Zunitra is technically speaking an 8 play point 13 11 if you evolve her, which doesn't seem like play at all. Um, two dragons is not that good turn eight and pass. Um, but so what makes me think two Maelstrom Serpents might be? Well, for one thing, Maelstrom Serpent does not require an evolve. For another thing, if you do happen to be in Vengeance turn eight, you suddenly spam the board with Maelstrom Serpents. You have a ton of five five on the board, and that's harder to clear, a lot harder to clear than just two five five. Um, I mean, Calamus Curse can do it and uh, Three Misses Decree can do it, but those are class-specific cards used in pretty defensive decks, and, I mean, if those are the only things that can clear a board full of 5-5, five five, you know, you're looking pretty good. However, this does require Vengeance to be activated, and, you know, having Vengeance activated on turn 8 is a scary prospect, especially against, uh, control, er, especially against Sword Trap decks, which can basically just kill you next turn with their 9 playing point Albert Evolve. Um, however, this card does combo well with the newly revealed Blood Moon, um, which is a amulet that activate that activates vengeance effects for you for a few turns um, as it counts down. So playing uh, Blood Moon before you play this card might get you huge value because you get like four five fives for just eight play points, and that's pretty scary. So yeah, um, I think Maelstrom Serpent does offer Control Blood a good way to, like, have a big board late game. Um, Control Blood, the current problem with Control Blood is, although it's one of the best control decks versus aggressive decks, because of the amount of healing it has and because of the vengeance effect, um, it's not a very proactive deck. You don't have much you can play. Um, you can obviously play neutral, such as Bahama and Lucifer, but you don't really have, like, big threats to put on the board. You're kind of just tanking things and hoping the opponent grinds out if you're in a control versus control matchup. You're kind of just, like, you know, praying they run out of resources before you do. Um, Maelstrom Serpent is a big proactive play that can drain your opponent's resources. It's a it's a solid eight play point finisher um, that ends your opponent if they don't deal with it well. Uh, sort of like Deepwood Anomaly, except I would argue that Maelstrom Serpent is even more threatening than Deepwood Anomaly because you can't remove it with just one card unless you're you know Earth Right Runecraft or um, Havencraft with Thanos. So yeah. I think this card is pretty interesting. I think it will see some play in Control Blood, maybe as a one or two of. Um, it may even see play as a three of in more like board-oriented, proactive Control Blood decks that run like two or three copies of Blood Moon and use a lot of the really good vengeance effects. So let's move on to Havencraft. Uh, this card, <laughs> first things first, I got this uh, picture off of another site, so yeah, chance of formatting again. But anyways, Heavenly Ages. This was one of the first cards revealed by Steigram, the first legendaries revealed by Steigram, anyways. And what I first saw, I thought it was insane. Can't do damage. Can't be targeted by spells and effects other than those that relate to attack and defense. For example, this follower cannot be destroyed or banished by using spells and effects. So, I mean, we don't know how it interacts with Bane yet, people have said. We don't know how other things might affect it. But, like, basically... I think right now we should assume this card is unremovable. If you play it as a 9.8.8 and then you evolve it to a 9.10.10, it's a 9.8.10.10. It's a 10.10. It will stay on the board. You are not getting rid of this 10.10. So, what does that mean? Well, first things first. This is another one of those theoretical, like, I play this, I win cards like Seraph. Um, Seraph, when played, you know, is literally an instant win card if you can get her to go off. She can be banished by Odin. This cannot. However, she comes on 8 play points. This one comes on 9. That's a pretty big difference. Um, like Seraph, this card is theoretically like a big tempo loss on 9. Um, in that you play it and you just kind of like hope your opponent doesn't start killing you fast enough. Um, but yeah, so people have been going insane about this card because it can be like a giant monstrosity that cannot be removed and then ends games in 2 hits, you know, with a 10 attack to face. And, but, if we step back and look at it a bit more logically, I mean, Haven already has Seraph, they already have Satan if they choose to run Satan in Defend Haven. Um, this card will not be affected by Guardian Sun, theoretically, because of, uh, it cannot be targeted or affected by other spells. So, it won't gain ward, it won't be an invincible ward, that would be absolutely crazy, I think it would be broken as hell, right? But, so... He is a 10-10. He, he is a 10-hit to the board 
always in, you know, phase every single turn if you evolve him. If you don't evolve him, he's still an 8. But he comes on turn 9. That's that's really slow. That's He almost reminds me of Polyphonus Roar in that you play him on turn 9 and you start getting massive value afterwards. But keep in mind that Polyphonus Roar is, like, never played because it's just so slow and just, just not that good. Um, I'm not saying Heavenly Aegis is not good. Heavenly Aegis is a lot harder to remove than Polyphonus Roar. It is theoretically a lot more powerful than Polyphonus Roar. Um, it's a good card, and it may see some play um, in Control Haven decks because it is a big finisher. And Control Haven kind of needed that because outside of Seraph Haven, which did require them run a lot of amulet uh, speed ups, which they may not have wanted to do, and Satan Haven, which is I don't think is in a very good place in the meta right now, uh, Haven doesn't really have like a way to win versus other control decks other than just trying to outvalue them. Um, Heavenly Aegis gives it this option, which I think is good. Uh, Heavenly Aegis is going to be is going to absolutely crush more responsive um, control decks like Control Blood not running the aforementioned Maelstrom Serpent, um, but against more, like, proactive control decks that, like, once they see this card, they start, you know, pushing forward hard for lethal, um, this card may not be that good, because this card did mean that you lost your turn 9 on just playing a single card, and just, you know, hoping it'll, the value it gets will save you from whatever they do. So yeah, a uh, really good card, um, I'm definitely gonna try it out, I really like the design of it, and I kind of like the effect, but we'll see if it's actually the monstrosity that everything, everyone thinks it is, or it's just, you know, a pretty good finisher. In the light of uh, the Heavenly Ages, this Dark Jian card kind of went unnoticed, and I don't think that's right, because Dark Jian is pretty cool. So, uh, like her counterpart Light Jian, she has a fanfare. Um, when she's played, she'll deal two damage to things. On f Different from uh, Light Jian, she deals two damage to everything. This includes your own followers as well as your opponents, so keep that in mind. Um, then she gives plus two plus zero to, again, all other followers. So this will give plus two plus zero to your opponent's followers. Consider carefully before you play her then, right? Um, that doesn't mean she's a bad card, I just think this is a very interesting card. Um, at six play points, she comes uh, earlier than her, you know, light counterpart. Uh, but she has the same stats, 5-5, five, five. so in a Guardian Sun deck, um, if you play her on 6, she will get the ward, which is pretty interesting, I think. Um, so, she's kind of like Ancient Lion Spirit, which does 2 damage to everything in your opponent's side of the field. Um, and a lot of times versus aggressive decks, Ancient Lion Spirit does clear their field, so if you play this card and it clears their field, you're, you're good, right? She uh, won't give any of them plus 2, plus 0, you know, to scare you and to, to hit your face with harder, right? Um, she does come later than Ancient Lion Spirit, but she doesn't require an evolution. Um, people say she may be run in Guardian Sun Haven, but personally, I don't think that's true. She kills the uh, Holy Falcon in 2-1, which is just not something you want to happen. She uh, sets your Holy Flame Tiger down to 2 defense, which is really low. Um, she ca can kind of combo with the Regal Falcon, give it 5 attack, but drop its defense down to 2, which is a 5-2 storm, which is... Alright, I guess. But if you're going for like a Storm Haven type thing, you really just want like to drop Erd instead because Erd is less situational, is just more dangerous and can put more damage in better and just has more utility. Um, I think Dark Jan will be used in um, uh, Control Haven decks as like a board clear. It comes earlier again than her light counterpart, and the effect is arguably better because in Control Haven craft decks, most of the time you won't have a field, your opponent will have a board. And you'll kind of have to work off of that. Um, that's why Famous is so good, because Famous Decree uh, clears theoretically the whole board, but most of the time you're just using it to clear your opponent's field. So yeah, Dark Jian kind of follows that same theory in that it kills everything, but most of the time you're just using it to kill your opponent. Um, again, be very careful while playing this card, because it can make your opponent smaller threats into bigger threats, and you will regret that. But... I think this card will maybe be a 1 or like a 2 of in Guardian Sun or General Control Haven decks, just because her fanfare of dealing to everything is really good, um, though I don't think her plus 2 plus 0 uh, will see much, will have much effect. So let's move on to the neutral legendary. We have here Zeus, the 10k play point 510. Um, basically the title legendary of this expansion, sort of like uh, Dark Angel Olivia or Bahamut in the previous two expansions. 
um, when you see a 10 play point neutral legendary, you immediately think of Satan, um, or you immediately think of Bahamut, both of which are big finisher cards. Uh, you play Satan, and you get the Apocalypse deck, which is very difficult to fight against. You play Bahamut, you nuke the entire board, and you have a giant 13-13 with theoretically nothing to stand up against. And, and, you know, if your opponent can't remove it, you win. Um, because, you know, 13-13 really hurts. Zeus theoretically should have the same kind of effect if you play him, and he, he, he kind of does. He's, he's, he's not a weak card, Th that's for certain. Um, he's 5'10", which is really big, and he comes with Storm, Bane, and Ward. So he's a very versatile card, in theory. Um, Bane is pretty good. I mean, worse comes to worse, you trade him into the Bahamut, and you take down a Bahamut with Nimbledus, you know, okay. Um, 5 attack is not small. You can kill a lot of things, and if you don't kill him, the Bane will take care of it anyways. Um, he can hit face because he has Storm. Admittedly, 10 play points for, you know, at most 7 damage to face is not super impressive. Gilgamesh does it for 8, and you never see Gilgamesh in play. Um, but the Ward also helps because Ward and Bane are a pretty good combination. Anything that trades into it dies, which is, you know, unfortunate for guys that trade into it. So yeah, he's like a well-rounded jack-of-all-trades. But I'm not sure that's what people want at 10 play points. What people want at 10 play points is they want things that will really help them win, like Bahamut, like uh, Satan. Zeus doesn't clear boards as well as Bahamut. He doesn't establish a solid win condition as well as Satan. He's sort of like something that will elongate the game. If you play him, you're saying the game has to keep continuing because I'm playing this big ward. Um, I'm playing something that can trade with my opponent. I want this game to keep going because I'm like waiting for something. And I'm just not sure that's good right now, because there's a lot of 10 play point finishers. Again, I turn to Bahamut, I turn to uh, Satan, but I also turn to um, Albert. I, you know, there's a lot of new combos coming out with this expansion too. So, I'm not sure something like Zeus, which theoretically slows down the game, even at turn 10, will really see much play. Admittedly... Uh, sorry, additionally, he's also susceptible to removal. Um, again, Satan is as well, and Bahamut is as well, admittedly. And, you know, Zeus comes in and has a more immediate effect than Bahamut. But, in the end, he's... He doesn't seem like a super impressive card. He seems alright. But, we don't really just want alright at 10 play points. We want something like this next card. So, I actually didn't know that Israfel was only 9 play points. But anyways, Israfel, 9 play points, 8, 8. That's pretty solid stats. Um, again, anything like past turn, even 5, you want to come with extra effects, not just stats. And Israfel comes with extra effects. Pretty good ones. Um, Fanfare, restore 4 defense to your leader. Great, you know, uh, immediate Lucifer-type heal. Solid, solid. And then, whenever this follower attacks, deal 2 damage to all enemies. I like that. Um, she's definitely been put with uh, the idea of anti-aggro decks in mind. Although, again, if you're making it to tw turn like nine versus an aggressive deck, um, you probably won already. You don't really need this stabilize, although it is nice. But Israfel is just a good like all-around card. Um, she's well statted. Admittedly, she doesn't have any cool bonus effects, so you do have to evolve her if you want to take advantage of the uh, deal two damage to all enemies right off the bat. But she's like, okay, she has like big stats. She has like. A solid effect that, you know, forces the opponent to either remove her or take some pretty solid punishment. Because not only can her, like, you know, 8 attack go face, um, it can theoretically clear their board by dealing 2 damage to everything. So, yeah, she's, she's a pretty good card. She doesn't fit in any specific archetype, I think, right now. Um, she'll kind of probably be tossed in, like Lucifer, uh, like Bahamut even, like Odin. As a general, like, let me just put this in there because it's a good all-around card. Um... She does have to compete with Olivia for the title of a neutral legendary to be splashed into all decks, but I think she's potentially worth it because, again, um, although making it to turn 9 versus aggro means you basically win versus aggro, um, it doesn't always, and having this final way to seal the deal is pretty great. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to say about this card. I kind of want to see how she does in the meta. I'm, I'm not going to switch out my Olivias for her, but in some of my control decks, I will potentially try to run more greed, you know, with her in it. But yeah. So yeah, that's all the legendaries from the Tempest of the Gods. Uh, I think these are all really cool legendaries. Um, they don't really introduce any new archetypes, but they definitely bolster some previous ones and may make some inviable ones playable again. Who knows, right? 
Um, anyways, if you enjoyed my reviews and you enjoyed my videos, uh, please leave a like or subscribe. That would really help my channel grow. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys later.